Hey, good morning, church family. So excited to be with you this morning. You know, I love spending time with our church family. Uh, a few of the things that I get a chance to do is I lead a men's Bible study here on campus on Thursday mornings. I get to spend time with our men from all ages. Uh, and actually, Friday night, I got to spend a few hours with our uh, college and career students at their game night. And then last night, we had a young single adults pickleball and pizza. So we played pickleball for a few hours. Still a little sore from that. Uh, but I just, I love spending time with our church family. I love spending time uh, here on this campus with everybody. Literally, I have the best job in the world, and I'm honored to be able to serve you in this capacity. So let me start out today with a story from my own life. Uh, when I was about eight or nine years old, uh, my cousin Benjamin and I uh, were playing basketball after a church service in the parking lot, which was pretty typical for us, right? But this one particular Sunday, we had a disagreement about the rules of the game. Now, I don't exactly remember all the specifics of the disagreement, but here's what I do remember. I remember that I got so mad at Benjamin that I picked up an old wooden baseball bat that was laying next to the basketball goal. I saw some of y'all wince. It's, it's going there. I picked up this old wooden baseball bat and I just threw it at him as hard as I could throw it. Now, to my surprise, my aim was spot on. The bat hits him in the side of the head, he grabs his ear, and he goes down hard. So what do I do? Well, I do what any good cousin would do in that situation. I ran away, and I went home, okay? I'm gonna come back to that story in a bit. There's, there's more to it. But I wanna ask you a question this morning, and I want you to ponder on it for just a moment. What makes you mad? What makes you angry? You know, we all get angry, but I think rarely we, under, we rarely understand where that anger comes from, and even more rarely, where it stems from and how it impacts our lives. Many people who are prone to anger, they actually just accept it, and many of them even say, well, that's just how I am. I'm just an angry person. Now, we know also that not all anger is bad, right? The Bible gives us provisions for righteous indignation or rightly directed anger. But oftentimes people just use that as an excuse to get mad about whatever it is that bothers them. We also know that righteous anger has a very high standard attached to it. And in reality, most of us are incapable or at the very least ill-equipped to deal with the anger that's in our hearts. So if you've been with us for the past few weeks, we've been in a sermon series, the Good Life Sermon Series, walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're continuing that this morning by looking at some of Jesus' teaching on controlling your anger, the heart of murder, and the kingdom of God. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We'll start out in verse 21 there. And so I want us to learn three things from the sermon. I want us to take three big things away. The first is I want us to learn to recognize the source of our anger. I want us to learn to recognize the impact of our anger, and I want us to learn to recognize the consequences of our anger. So the source, the impact, and the consequences of our anger. Now, before we jump into the text here, there's a few things that we need to be reminded of uh, to kind of orient us to where we're at. So Matthew here has composed his gospel in such a way that Matthew is presenting Jesus as the new Moses, the new lawgiver, on a new mountain giving a new set of commands to the people of God. And so in last week's sermon, we read where Jesus tells his audience that he came to fulfill the law and not to abolish it. And that's important because that's kind of the hinge verse that the rest of the chapter's teaching flows off of. And so we're gonna see here in this next section of Matthew chapter five, uh, that Jesus gives us six examples of how to follow the law in this new kingdom that he is establishing. And the first example in those six that Jesus is going to give to us in the Sermon on the Mount to illustrate this new kingdom ethic is anger. He's going to talk to us this morning about anger. And there's a few things to consider. One, Jesus here is focused on combating legalism, not the law. Right? So the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and others, they were often wrongly concerned with simply the external obedience to the law, keeping the letter of the law. However, their mistake, like many of ours today, is that they often missed the true meaning of the law, which was concerned with the posture of the heart towards the law and seeing the law not as a means to an end itself, but seeing the law as a way to direct, direct your heart and attention back to the lawgiver. 
Now, it's also not correct to say that Jesus places, he replaces the law with his own commands. Jesus doesn't abolish the law. He doesn't replace the law. In no case, actually, does he actually even relax the law. Rather, he's showing that when rightly understood, the law actually goes much deeper and much further to the heart than his hearers had often understood. So essentially, hearkening back to verse 20, Jesus is saying this. He's saying, by living with the proper intent and motives of the heart towards God, those who are in the new kingdom of God, which by the way, only happens through a faith-based relationship with Jesus Christ, but those who are in the new kingdom of God will live out a righteousness that surpasses even that of the Jewish leadership. And it's with that bold claim of Jesus that we jump into verse 21 here. And we'll take a look at our first example he gives us about dealing with anger. So our first point, recognizing the source of your anger. Verse 21 reads, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So Jesus here, the true lawgiver, how Matthew is presenting him, he takes them right back to the law. And immediately in verse 21, he quotes from Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not kill, familiar verse that we know. Now, the word murder in most of our translations here is actually probably the better translation of the word to kill because it clarifies that the killing itself was a criminal killing. It was a murder. It wasn't self-defense or some other type of killing that was given provision for in the Old Testament. And that also helps clarify there where he says that those who murder will be liable to judgment. And he's talking about specifically uh, the human courts and the death penalty that was prescribed by God in the Old Testament. That was the penalty for murder. And these people knew that. That wasn't anything unfamiliar to them. But think with me for a second how significant these words are coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Put yourself in the first century Jewish hearers, shoes, if you will, or sandals, I guess. And hear what Jesus says. He says, you've heard that it was said, right? He's talking about the rabbis for generations that had taught them different interpretations of the law, how to live out the law, how to be obedient to the law. He said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, Jesus here, he's not offering just another different interpretation of the law. Jesus is saying by this declaration that his words are equally as authoritative as the words of scripture. One commentator puts it this way, Jesus is not offering a new contribution to the exegetical debates, but Jesus is offering a definitive declaration of the will of God. That is radical. There's no wonder that the religious leaders of his day didn't like him. So Jesus in this verse, he's focused on the crime of murder and on the penalty that it carries. However, in the next verse, the scenario changes ironically and he describes a more severe punishment that accompanies a seemingly lesser offense. He says in verse 22, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So he starts with murder. Now he's talking about just being angry. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in the danger of the fire of hell. So first of all, Jesus is not saying, as some people have suggested, that being angry is the same as murder and that it holds the same consequences. That's not what he's saying. What the text does say, however, is that Jesus is introducing a few different ways that a person can violate the heart of the law, do not murder, how they can violate the heart of that law by committing violations other than the actual physical act of murder. The first part of 22 there says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. So what Jesus is doing is he's taking us deeper here. He's taking us to the root of the problem and he declares that murder is actually not the problem. In fact, it's actually a symptom of the larger problem, which is anger, anger that we're harboring in our hearts. Again, this isn't righteous anger, you know, anger against injustice or violence, evil, things like that. Those things should make us angry. And that is a righteous anger that we have here. But Jesus here is talking about an anger that stems from a personal offense or from selfishness or pride. And what Jesus is doing here is he's shifting the focus of his hearers from the external, the external obedience to the law to the internal conformity to the ways of Jesus. From the external obedience to internal obedience, and he's shifting their mindset from focusing on the temporal things in life 
to having an eternal perspective. So from external to internal and from temporal to eternal. And this is the pattern of the whole Sermon on the Mount. It's literally living right side up in an upside down world. And living in the kingdom of God requires, according to Jesus, the highest of ethical standards. And ultimately, this means internal conformity to the way of Jesus, not simply external conformity or compliance to the law. See, Jesus is addressing the anger in one's heart that really is the rotten seed that ultimately leads some to commit the act of murder. So the question really isn't what makes you angry. It's not even who gets angry. The question is, why do we all get angry? Now, I've learned through some of my research and classes that anger is actually a secondary emotion. Anger is always a reaction to something deeper in our lives, and oftentimes it's unrealized. And you've heard it said from the pulpit here before, our deepest emotions always point us to our idols. What you get the maddest about might just show you what you love the most. And I know oftentimes anxiety in our lives surface as anger. Anger is often linked to a past pain or trauma that you've experienced. And the current situation that you find yourself in, getting so angry, is actually just a self-defense response mechanism to that pain or trauma in the past. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, A Grief Observed, he wrote this quote. He said, I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name was Grief. I sat with my anger long enough until she told me that her real name was grief. You see, people oftentimes get so angry because they're grieving the loss of something. And I got to think, well, what about here in our church? I know people are grieving the loss of all kinds of things. And, and one thing in particular that people grieve the loss of is change. When things change and they often say, well, if that changes, then I'm going to lose something that I love. But in reality, change doesn't equal loss changes the addition of something new, right? Not the loss of something old. But anger often stems from grief. It stems from anxiety. It stems from all other sorts of things. But the point is that if we never get to the root of our anger, then we're never going to get it under control. You need to wrestle with that. Not just what makes you angry, but why do you get so angry over things? And if you need help wrestling with that, we have resources here. The center, we had slides up earlier talking about the center. You can go to our website and go and make an appointment with them. It's a counseling service that we partner with. They would love to help you walk through uh, and wrestle with anger in your life. All right, so hang with me here on this first point. I promise the last two aren't as long as this one. We got the connect group to get to. But the final two examples in this verse here that Jesus uses to demonstrate how we violate the heart of the law are similar. He goes on in this verse to say, a second violation of this kingdom ethic is saying to another person, Raka. Anybody said that to anybody this week? No? Okay. Well, that's good. We can skip over this part. No. Well, we don't know what Raka means, but evidently it was used by angry people. And when I thought about it, I was like, well, what are some unholy words that come to our minds that people use when they're angry against others. I mean, think about it. What are some unholy words that come to your mind right now when you think about you're mad at somebody? Now, repent for thinking that, shame on you. <laughs> but seriously, think, committing this violation here, according to Jesus, it would get you brought before the Sanhedrin, which was kind of like the Supreme Court of their day. It was the highest Jewish authority. And the third example he uses of violating the law is he says, if you call someone a fool, now, in both cases here with raka or with fool, it's equivalent to calling someone stupid or worthless. I don't think Jesus is splitting hairs between the word meanings here, but the point that he's trying to make is that the person who is angry enough to dehumanize and demean another person has a serious heart issue, and that person is capable of committing murder. Now, there's an interesting progression here that I think that's worth noting, that Jesus moves from murder to insult to treating someone with contempt. From murder to anger and then insult and contempt. And ironically here in the text, as the offense in our minds lessens, the penalty that Jesus ascribes to it actually increases. So he starts out talking about murder. He says, that'll get you taken to court. Talk about the local court. 
And then next he says, if you get angry with your brother or sister, that'll take you to the Supreme Court. And then finally, he says, if you insult someone or you treat them with contempt, you'll stand before the judgment of God. Now, this is meant to cause uh, his hearers to pause and say, hang on a minute. Like, what's going on here? Right? And this is the beauty of Jesus' wisdom teaching. And what Jesus is getting at is he's saying, sure, murder is bad. Not denying that, right? Not turning over the law. Murder is bad. We shouldn't do that. But the heart posture that allows you to murder someone is in fact present in the heart that allows itself to dehumanize and humiliate others with our words. Man, think about that. We often overlook this idea of treating someone with contempt. It's not a word we use often in our vocabularies, but the word contempt is the feeling that a person is beneath consideration. In your mind, that person is worthless. And you may ask, well, why is this so serious? Well, it's serious because you're dehumanizing them, right? So to insult them is to say, you are not even worthy of my attention. You do not even exist in my mind. And what you're doing is you're making a value judgment on the life of another human being who was created in the image of God when you say, you mean nothing to me. But the reality is they mean something to God. And when we sidestep God and we make our own value judgments about people that bear his image to Jesus, that is a big deal. Doesn't matter what letter comes after their name of the political party. When we make value judgments on that person's worth because we are angry with them, that is a big deal, big deal to God. Let's think about this because we're prone to do it and we certainly see this all the time in our culture. Uh, Elie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor, going, went on to be an author, an activist, professor, and actually a Nobel Prize winner. He wrote this, the opposite of love is not hate, it's actually indifference. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I think he's on to something because indifference signals contempt and it implies that uh, the person is worthless and that type of hurt actually cuts deeper than just palpable hatred. Contempt cuts to the very root of our identity and our self-respect and a heart that is what Jesus is saying, a heart that is capable of contempt is a heart that's capable of murder. It starts with our heart. And our anger reveals our heart and what controls it. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Enneagram in here. Well, I'll show my cards. I'm an Enneagram eight. And so I follow a lot of Enneagram stuff and I've read through the book and uh, listened to it. And I've recently discovered about myself, right, that one of the things that makes me the most angry is when I feel like someone is trying to control me, right? Now, I don't desire to have control over the situation necessarily, but when I start feeling like the person in the situation is taking control of me and I've lost my autonomy, that starts making me really angry. And I put up my defense mechanisms in a hurry, right? So knowing that about myself now, going back to the story with my cousin, and I lashed out, I really think, because I felt like he was trying to control the situation Right? And I felt like he was trying to control me by telling me what to do. And so in that moment, the source of my anger wasn't my cousin. It wasn't that he was making up rules or getting on my nerves or whatever that it was. The source of my anger was my desire for control. You know, one of the things we do as we prepare for these messages is we first preach the message to ourself. And that is the most convicting part for me this week was learning that a lot of times the source of my anger with my wife, the source of my anger with my kids is because I feel like I'm losing control of the situation. And that's important to be able to recognize in ourselves. So we've learned to recognize the source of our anger. Now let's learn to recognize the impact of our anger. And I'll tell you how the story with my cousin ends. So the second point here, recognizing the impact of your anger. In verse 23, Jesus says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and often offer your gift. Now, notice right away in the text, there's some shift in the language here. He shifts in pronouns. He goes from saying anyone to saying 
you. Second person singular. Jesus goes from speaking in generalities to directing what he's saying directly to his audience here. It's like me saying, you know, those people and everyone out there. And then he goes, but you and your anger. He's making this sharply personal. And so what is Jesus getting out here? Well, he's making a couple of points that both that revolve around this idea of reconciliation, which he'll finish up in the next couple of verses. So he cues up this scenario where some of the members of his audience are uh, hypothetically going to the temple to offer a gift. Now, this could have been money or food or a variety of different things. But the main point is going to the temple and offering sacrifice is one of the main ways that the Jews worshiped God. So Jesus says to them, hey, if you're heading to worship and you remember that you have a conflict with someone, either you're harboring hate and anger against them or maybe they're harboring anger against you because you've wronged them. He says, you need to press pause. Well, hold up, wait, wait a minute. You need to press pause on your worship and go and seek reconciliation with that person. He even goes the far as say, even if you have made it all the way to the altar with your gift, you've made it all the way to church on Sunday morning, you're sitting here in the pews, you're listening to me preach this sermon and you realize, yep, I got beef with somebody. They've upset me, I've upset them. There's a need for reconciliation. Jesus says, you need to press pause on your worship of me and you need to go make it right with them. And you may be thinking, man, does Jesus really think that resolving conflict is more important than worshiping God? And the answer that he gives is actually, you can't properly worship God until you have been reconciled with your brother and sister. You see, our right relationship with others is actually one of the main ways that we demonstrate our right relationship with God. This is the picture of the cruciform life that we talk about so often, that our horizontal relationship with others impacts our vertical relationship with God, vice versa, and they are equally as important. And this means that preparing our hearts for worship is a big deal because God does not overlook our relationship with others when we come to worship him. Jesus makes it plain here, the act of worship itself is not as important as the spirit in which it is done. The act of worship itself is not as important as the spirit in which it is done. And I wanna say this as well, we don't just prepare our hearts for worship on Sunday, right? As believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, every day is a day of worship for us because our lives are meant to be lived as an act of worship to him. And that means we seek to live faithfully each day, moment by moment, hour by hour, we are called to faithfully steward our lives and our possessions and our emotions and our anger for his glory. One great way that we have uh, to help us do that is our, our new dwell readings. These have been out you know, for about a year. We got brand new journals. They're out this morning. I hope you grab yours. Uh, but our whole church, everyone is reading together. We've been reading this week in Colossians. Uh, and this is a great way to start your day. Start your day in the word. Start your day with God. And that'll help you prepare your heart to live a life of worship. Now, Going back to the story of my cousin, uh, later that night, so after the incident happened, I go home, I snuck past him, and uh, on the way out, my parents didn't know I was in the clear. We went home, and then that night, we had church service again. Anybody remember Sunday night services? Yeah, I grew up in a good Southern Baptist church. We were there all Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, Wednesday night, all right. Uh, and so that evening, I remember Benjamin actually walking in the church, and he has this huge bandage on his ear. And I'm like, you dummy, you're going to give it away. You know, he's showing everybody. Uh, no, but his parents make eye contact with me and they're not very happy with me either. And so now my parents see it and they got to be nosy and they got to go over there and ask what happened. Well, to their surprise, they actually find out that it was their own son that inflicted those injuries. Uh, and so my parents weren't happy with me either. And boy, I mean it when I say that my parents lived out the proverb Spare the rod, hate the child. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them, right? So they showed me a lesson learning amount of well-deserved love when I got home from church that night. They're actually watching the live stream right now. They probably don't remember this, but I do. You see, I'd, I'd allowed my anger to control my life and it resulted in physical harm 
to my cousin, to my friend. It resulted in wrecking havoc on his parents' day, and it caused my parents a lot of unnecessary grief. Here's what I want you to see. Your, your anger, it impacts you, and it impacts everyone you come into contact with. You know, I would have been way better off if I had been able to control my anger and I'd been able to reconcile the disagreement with my cousin before I almost took his ear off, but certainly before my parents got a hold of me, right? And we're going to see in these next verses, Jesus is going to talk about being handed over to the judge. And that's the point that I got to in that situation. So we've seen here how to recognize the source of our anger. We've seen how to recognize the impact of our anger. Finally here, let's learn to recognize the consequences of our anger. Verse 25 says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and then you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus here gives his third and final example of the heart behind the law not to murder. And he sets up this rhetorical scenario where a person is being taken to court by another person. And he tells his audience that the best case scenario is to settle this matter outside of court before it ever makes it to the judge if possible, right? Because he says, once you make it to the judge, your life is in his hands. There's no taking this before a judge and then being like, oh, never mind. Don't wanna, don't wanna do this now. Once you're there, you're there. So don't read too deeply here into the metaphor. Jesus is telling us that our actions have consequences and that if our unjust anger has escalated our situation to the point of going to court with our neighbor, if it's stemming from unjust anger, then we need to settle that matter with them before it gets to that point. Jesus is hammering home his point. If you do not deal with your anger, you will pay a huge price. Our actions have consequences. Our anger has consequences, both in our social and our spiritual lives. And friends, there is no such thing as unjust anger without consequences. There's always consequences for our unjust anger. And I think how many of us have allowed our anger to come out in words that we regret and we can never come back. I lie you not, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was, I was not short one bit on examples of how my anger has gotten me in trouble, how my anger has hurt my wife, how my anger has hurt various objects in my house over the 13 years of our marriage. And I praise God that I'm, I'm not that way now, but I used to be. And as I was considering what, you know, stories to tell, uh, I was rightly embarrassed with the number of times that I could think of in my life that my anger had gotten me in trouble. And so this has been super convicting for me as well. I think about how many people we've hurt, uh, even physically, or hurt ourselves because of our anger. How many relationships have been destroyed? How many people are in prison now because they didn't stop the progression of anger? In the end, failure to take advantage of the opportunity of reconciliation means that one must now bear the penalty of being unreconciled. Unrighteous anger always requires reconciliation. Unrighteous anger will destroy you and it will destroy your relationship and it always requires reconciliation. So we see here that Jesus calls us to address this issue with urgency. The matter of reconciliation needs to be done urgently because the secondary thing that Jesus is getting at is that the state of our soul is an urgent matter. And when we think about human beings in our natural form, we are sinful and eternally separated from a righteous and holy God, deserving of his righteous wrath because of our sin. But God didn't leave us there. God takes the first step towards us and he provides a way for reconciliation. And that comes through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's only through reconciliation with the Father, through Jesus Christ, that we have a hope of living out this higher kingdom ethic of controlling our anger. Without the Spirit of God working in your life, you will never fully get your anger or anything else in your life under control. Friends, if you haven't been reconciled 
to God through Jesus Christ this morning, that's your application. Stop trying to fix your life by yourself. Try trying to get your anger under control. If you have never experienced reconciliation through Jesus Christ, then you'll never truly be able to reconcile with anyone else. So I'm going to invite you to respond to God right now. We're going to have a time of response as our band comes and, and sings over you. And here's what I want you to do. Maybe you're listening to the sermon and you've had a name come to mind and you're thinking right now, like that's, yep, that's a person that I know is angry with me or maybe that I'm angry against. I'm harboring anger in my heart against them. There's unresolved conflict. I'm going to ask you to think about that person. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to start the process of reconciliation. Now, I want, to, I want to be clear about reconciliation. Reconciliation doesn't mean that there's going to be a restored relationship after that. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily even going to be friends after that. Sometimes that's not even possible to reach out to someone to be reconciled um, because that person maybe is refusing to cooperate or perhaps the person you need to be reconciled with has passed on. And that's okay. There's grace for that. There's grace for that. But if that person is still available to you, I'm going to encourage you to reach out. Now, hear me say this. I know there's some here today who have found themselves in the midst of abusive relationships. But there is reconciliation there. But I'm never going to ask you to go back into an abusive situation. It's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm asking you to do is to reflect upon your heart. And if you're angry with someone, if you're holding contempt for them in your heart, reflect on that right now. And as the band comes to sing, I'm going to challenge you to do one thing. I'm gonna challenge you to pull out your phone and send that individual a text message, something simple. Hey, do you have time to chat this week? I'd like to talk to you about something. Why am I doing that? I'm doing that because we always preach towards application. How does the word of God apply to me in my life? What do I do now that I've heard what God says? We always preach towards application and right now is the time of obedience. If you send that text now, you don't have time to talk yourself out of it later. You don't have time to put the brakes on what the Spirit of God is doing in your life, moving you towards reconciliation, growing you in your faith, if you start that process right now. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move over towards the next steps uh, area. And the band's just gonna sing over you a few verses. I'm gonna challenge you now to, to take that step of obedience. Um, maybe you've been here today and you heard about baptism and you're like, man, I would love to participate in that baptism service in like two hours. You can do that. Come talk to us right over there. We'll get you baptized today. If that's what God is prompting you to do, we want you to respond in obedience to how God is moving in your life. If you want prayer from a minister, from our other leaders in the church, we'll be over there for you as well. I'll end with this. I spent some time with our young adults this weekend. And one thing I know is that there's been people seriously hurt through dating relationships or the lack thereof. If you've hurt somebody, you need to reconcile that. Whether that's in your relationship, whether that's through your job, whether that's in your family, you need to be the one that steps out to seek reconciliation for them. So move now as the Spirit of God prompts us as our band leads us in worship. Thanks, Han.